Hello. Hi. Oh, how are you, Rabbi? I'm good. How are you doing? Good, thank you. I'm going to change my virtual background because we're not a camp. <laughs> um, um, do you have a preference? Do you Would you like this to go live on Facebook or would you prefer not? You know, I was just actually looking because I was wondering that question myself and I saw that um, Susan, sure. I mean, if it's, um, I would say it's actually up to you. I probably would obviously wait until people. Um, yes, yes. So, How long um, is your breakout room session? The breakout room session, I don't think should be live. It's kind of all or nothing. So what happens during the breakout is it's just dead air. Um, um, so that's what if we, um, um, we could all end the recording yes it's gonna be like let's do that or yeah i think maybe let's do that great so i'll end it right when we go into the breakout rooms and then um you said three people per breakout room right yeah i thought that would be a nice um mm -hmm. oh that looks like very zoom background doesn't it i think it looks nice okay um, um, how long are the breakout sessions? Uh, well, I think a, a gem, generally I was thinking about six minutes. So each person has two minutes to share. Okay. I think I will also play it by ear a little bit. If we feel like we're running fast, then I actually would rather give people a little more time to talk and especially because there's kind of that schmooze opportunity, which is nice. So I would say somewhere between six and 10 minutes, um, okay. we can kind of look at I figure, I figure after we come back, there'll be some, we want to do some sharing and this will be like far, farther down in the lesson anyway. So, um, um, I'm going to give you in the chat, my cell phone number, just like, right. you know, That's if perfect. you're like, Hey, we need to come out now or we need minutes longer. That will be an easy yep. way. To okay. Let me give you mine too. Okay. Um, and how can you hear me? Okay. How's my connection? Sounds great. Okay. Yeah. Um, um, I will tend to uh, turn my video off after the first few minutes. Um, but I'm here. If you need me, you can just talk to me. Or oh, great. And then did you make me a co-host? Yes. Great. So I can share. Let me just try. Oh, let me actually pull this up. Close it. I have a... Um, there we go. Yeah, that'll work. Great. Okay, I'll just stop that for now, but it's good to know that works. Yeah, my only hesitation with the Facebook Live would be that um, it's slightly more personal in nature. So from your experience, do people care? Do they tend to um, share any less? Like if I ask, you know, a question like we were talking about, we're gonna be talking about Rosh Hashanah symbols. If I ask a question like is do any of these symbols particularly resonate with you this year? Are people gonna feel any less willing to share because? Um, well, the, the awkward thing is that they just aren't on the screen. So when we do right. Facebook Live, I spotlight you and pin you. So you're the only face that anyone hears. Now they can okay. hear that anyone sees, they can hear yeah. other people's voices, but they will not be shown on the screen, okay. which for those who are a little bit less techie on Zoom, they might not be able to figure out how to like actually go to the speaker Zoom versus the full screen. Do you know what I'm saying? But like, like, cause oh, yeah. I'm gonna have you spotlit and if they don't know enough to click back into the yeah. gallery view, then they just see you the whole time. But okay. we've been doing this for a while. I, I think yeah. it's fine. Um, yeah, and I'll even mention that after I introduce myself, I, I said I might mention a few things about, use, we invite you to use your video, rename yourself. Um, yeah. And I, I'll even encourage people to choose if you go up to your view option or you can choose gallery view. Um, that way you can see other people when we share, so. Great, okay. Um, I'm just going to run to the restroom because I've just yeah. come off a call. Sounds um, good. But I'll be just back in a moment. Okay. Sounds great. Thank you. Oh, 
And one other question I had is, do you want to, usually we start letting people in now. Is that okay? Yeah, totally. Okay. Hi, Rabbi. Hi, Tessa. How are you? Baruch Hashem. Very well. And yourself, dear? And your I'm, family? I'm doing just fine. I love the art. This, the one nice thing about virtual learning is you get a little, I, I have a fake background, so it's not so helpful, oh. but um, I love the art in your home. Thank you. Thank you. We have a lot of art. This one is a Charles Bragg. Uh, I don't know if you're familiar with him. We have a plumber over. Thank God he came today. Oh, I had wow. A, so uh, he's just leaving now. So we were masked because uh, for proto you know, safety protocols. Yeah, of course. But you don't need to hear my plumbing service. But uh, so I'm going to put myself on mute and we'll come sit down as soon as we can. Sounds great. Enjoy. Thank Have you. a good time. We'll talk to you later. We'll, we'll be here. Sounds good. Hi, welcome, Ron. Welcome, Miriam. Thank you. Welcome back. Thank you. How are you doing? Oh, well, that's such a complicated question these days. Yeah. We've got pandemic and fires, and we've had two days of eternal dusk. Yeah, is it? We're, get, we're getting rained ash down here. Is it like that up there as well? Yeah, a lot yeah, of ash. A lot of ash. Mm -hmm. Yeah and very unhealthy air today. Yes. Did you have that bizarre orange sky yesterday too? Oh, yes. 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 Red. It was the weirdest thing. It felt like it was 5 a.m. all day yesterday. Or the like end it was about to be dawn. <sighs> You're staying we'll healthy room. though? What's that? You're staying healthy? Miriam, you're muted. We can't hear you if you're trying to share. Yeah, I've been away for three months. I'm going to come home on uh, Sunday to the dirt and the heat. <laughs> yep. Well, it's yeah. not hot anyway. Oh, that's good. That's yeah. a help. That's a help. No, it's in the 60s. Oh, okay. That's mostly because we don't have any sun. We haven't had sun for oh. two days. <laughs> yeah. When I lived in Santa Barbara, we had a lot of fires, and I was always sweeping away the ash. It would always fall right. over the outside furniture and the porch and everything. Mm -hmm. yeah. And then the choppers would be overhead dropping uh, water. <laughs> Luckily, the synagogue in Santa Barbara had installed a watering system on the roof, and somebody came and turned it on, so the building was saved. Yeah. Interesting. Yeah. Yeah. But. Well, welcome, everyone. We'll give maybe another minute for people to arrive through the waiting room. And... Uh, and then we'll go ahead and start. I'm going to put a, uh, a question up for you to, to think about. And if you'd like to, I invite you to share a response in the, the chat um, if you would like to, just to kind of get us, get us thinking. OK.
Okay, I think we'll go ahead and start. If you, Sarah, if you, um, if you want to have us go ahead and go live, uh, feel free to do so. Thank you for people who are starting to share in the chat. Welcome. Um, so my name is Rabbi Sarah Shulman. It's great to be back in the Kol Shofar community, virtual community, uh, for High Holidays this year. Uh, in my everyday life, I'm the director of Camp Ramah in Northern California, our local overnight Jewish summer camp. And uh, it's been really a pleasure to join the Kol Shofar rabbis and community for High holiday services with a special focus on youth and families over the, the past five years, and I look forward to doing that again this year. Uh, today, for our Bringing High Holidays Home, uh, we're going to talk about that really directly by looking at the lens of what in Hebrew we generally talk about simanim, or in English we might say symbols. Um, this, this year, because our sanctuary for most of us will look like this or your living spaces, living rooms, dining rooms, our own homes are going to become our sanctuaries. I think the high holiday symbols bring on a particularly strong meaning for us in addition to everything else that's powerful about the prayers and the music and the community moments and so many other things. So today what we're gonna do is we're gonna take a deep dive into some of the symbols with the hope that they can bring new meaning for us in this difficult time, that they can help us bring new meaning for our high holiday meals and high holiday service and just general experience in life uh, at this time. Uh, one of my personal sort of mantras as a rabbi is that Judaism is best when it is truly relevant and personable, person, personal in our lives. And I think the symbols are one way in addition to ritual and others of accessing that personal spiritual meaning of, of the high holidays. So uh, if you ha have the pleasure of joining us today on Zoom, it is really nice to see you. Um, I'll invite you, thank you so many people for sharing your video. It really helps us to be able to see one another and feel connected. So I encourage you to continue to share your video. Uh, to be able to see other people, you can change your view to gallery and that will also give you a chance to be able to see other people while we are having conversation and sharing because um, this will be an interactive um, experience in presenta presentation today. So we will do a number of different things in terms of discussion, a little text study, um, and sharing. A little bit later on in the session, we'll also break out into breakouts so we have an opportunity to talk a little bit more for those of us that are on Zoom with just a few other people to talk about some of our uh, moments from the last year that lead us into high holidays. Um, great. And if you, since this is a lunch and learn, I also invite you, if you're eating, feel free to eat. This is not Yom Kippur. We, uh, we welcome you to eat uh, also while you're munching, while you're on, uh, on, the, on the session today. So I'm going to go ahead and share my screen. Uh, if at any point the technology stops working or just, just uh, send a message to the chat so that to uh, Sarah Glass, who's helping us out, or myself, so we can be sure to uh, to fix it so that you can uh, you can see it. Um, so first of all, I invite you just to take a moment and think about what's an aspect of Rosh Hashanah or Yom Kippur that is particularly meaningful for you. Maybe there's a particular prayer or a food or being together with your family. Maybe it's something that you can do this year. Maybe it's not. Uh, and just take a moment to think about that. Um, and I'd like to invite, if there's anyone that would like to share something, I saw that someone put a few things in, in the chat, um, and uh, I wanted to see if there's anyone like to share to sort of help us set the tone as we think about bringing the High Holidays home. 
I see uh, apples and honey, Karen said. Dinner with family. Return for renewal. Does anyone else have something they'd like to share either in the chat or uh, just to unmute yourself and share? Okay. Yeah, I'm, I'm very moved at, at Yom Kippur, at the end of Yom Kippur with the singing of Eliyahu Hanavi and having my arms around a family member. Mm -hmm. I don't know, that, that always gets me. Thank you. Thank you. <clears throat> Is there someone else that would like to share? Raise your hand if you find the music, like of Kol Nidre or the High Holiday music, something that is meaningful for you. Yeah, that's for sure. Mm -hmm. yeah. Raise your hand if the family time is something, the kind of family time to be being together or community time is something that either of old or of present time that is course, meaningful. Yeah. Can I say something? Please. Yeah, um, we won't have it exactly the same this year, but um, um, there's a lot of regular uh, Shabbat goers, but on, on the high holidays, we get to see some other people, lots of other people that we don't get to see every, every week. Um, so that feeling of all gathering together um, on the high holidays is, is always very moving to me. Mm -hmm. And we'll have that again now, you know, I'm sure we'll in a different form, but this year we'll have it. Mm -hmm. Yeah. Instead of having to open up the back of the, the bait, um, um, for, to be able to fit everyone in for the services, we'll be vigorously admitting people in the, through the waiting room on zoom. Things will, will look different this year. More ways than one. We'll continue, we're going to continue on. Um, I think one of the things that can be particular meaningful also um, is the symbols like this one, the shofar and so many other foods and things that bring the holiday out. So we're going to talk a little bit more about, uh, about that today. Move. So there are many symbols. Um, these are just a few of them that, uh, that Rosh Hashanah and Yom Kippur bring out and elevate for us from our everyday lives. Um, probably the, the most known and um, in some ways the most powerful symbol of the holiday for many of us is the shofar. Uh, the spiritual cries of the shofar, the shofar as the alarm clock waking them up, waking us up, which we're going to explore in more detail uh, a little bit later, um, is certainly one of those symbols. But there's also so many food symbols, the apples and honey, uh, the round challah, which is the cycle of life continuity, but also connects to some of the themes in our liturgy of coronation and, and kingship. Um, then there, at, and there are the crumbs that we throw in the water at Tashlich, also another form of bread. Um, many people like to put a pomegranate on their table. Uh, the, the idea of those seeds being almost as plentiful as the 613 meets vote, or also a symbol of fertility. Um, I know last year I had um, fortunately suffered a miscarriage uh, about a week before Rosh Hashanah. And so for last year, for me personally, that pomegranate was uh, a powerful symbol and both a um, message of hope, but also a message of loss. Uh, and that each of the symbols can take on um, new meaning for us in our lives every year. There's the fish head, uh, which we like to say, we like to be the head and not the tail. Um, it's, a, it's a symbol of leadership or taking initiative. 
Then there's things we wear. Um, we dress in white, particularly for Yom Kippur, but some of us for, throughout the whole high holidays through a kittle, um, which can represent our closeness to death um, or purity like the angels or a sense of atonement. And then there's many other foods that others um, will bring. In, in Israel, it's actually become a, a common practice to have a high holiday Seder, um, where you actually have a bunch of different symbols at the table, almost like we would on Passover. And you say the blessings for each of the symbols. Some of us will just do this for apples and honey or the round challah, and other people really add to it or eat traditional foods, carrots or beets, dates and leeks. And these are really where the rabbis get into, uh, and in people of old and, and current get into wordplay. So a lot of these are playing with Hebrew or even the Yiddish equivalents uh, for these. So like carrots, uh, gezer, which is which a carrot is in Hebrew, is like gezera, which is a judgment. So wishing that we would have a favorable judgment this year. Or with beets, which are selek, which is like siluk which is to be removed. So we might think about the removal of hatred uh, in our world or something. Dates, tamar, which is like tom, which also means the end. It's something we want to end. Maybe it's COVID and sickness. Maybe it's hatred or something else. Uh, then there's leeks, which is karti, which is like karate, which means to be banished, excommunicated traditionally. Uh, in rabbinic literature and elsewhere. Um, I think there the hope is that we may not be isolated so much in this coming year or something like that. And other people have traditional foods that they might eat um, that also have symbolism. Like, did anyone here ever grow up with or have black eyed peas um, at, uh, at a Rosh Hashanah meal? I remember as a kid, that was always my least favorite of the foods. But uh, there it's um, rubia, which is like yerbu, which means to increase. So we think about in increasing good merits or, or other things. And then people really uh, get creative with this and, and also use Yiddish um, meaning words also. Does anyone have, um, other than the ones I've listed here, does anyone else have a particular food that they like to have that has meaning at their Rosh Hashanah or high holiday uh, Meals. I think I saw a hand. Yeah, go ahead and yeah. share. Um, we always had chicken soup with the thin little noodles. And my mother, who was not observant at all, always said, oh, that's for, and she called them good deeds. She goes, that's for all the good deeds you're supposed to do for the year. Great. So it, it, it so it's just another, it remind me kind of of the pomegranate yeah. seeds, you know, the, the bountiful, the many. Yeah. Absolutely. Right. And a lot of these start to seem like they're heading in a similar direction, but through different kinds of foods, maybe also what's available. Obviously, there's Ashkenazi and Sephardic differences, too, and different kind of traditions that come out. I think I saw uh, another hand um, that someone that wanted to share that shared their virtual hand. Did you want to share something? Uh, that's fine, Sue. I was just going to say that with the carrot, uh, there's a gezer, which is also from the word ligazor which means to cut. Mm -hmm. And one idea of that is that you are cutting the severity of the decree. You're decreasing the severity of the decree uh, on Rosh Hashanah. So, so come, you know, Yom Kippur, it'll be less severe. Mm -hmm. Thank you. Thank you. Is there anyone else that has a food tradition or a symbol that, um, that, that they've had at their high holiday meals or that is come up in their families? So take a look at this list and think about the symbols. And I invite you to think about if there's any of these symbols that are particularly resonant with you this year. What's going on in your world what's going on in your city or the world or your family? Uh, what resonates with you this year? Take a moment to think about that.
Does anyone want to share something that comes up for them? <laughs> I see some laughter. I don't know if that's related yeah. to this or. Well, I'm just saying uh, there's 25 people, maybe in the breakout groups. <laughs> yeah. um, I'll good. say that um, our granddaughter has learned to blow the show far. So mm -hmm. um, that's been pretty exciting. And I gave it a try. I couldn't do it. <laughs> Great. She has the technique. Mm -hmm. Great. We have a tradition we're going to miss this year. We've moved into Ron and Ria's house for Yuntif for many years now, and we're going to have to be at home without them. What a loss. Mm -hmm. Yeah. Thank you for sharing that. I'm looking forward to um, making my round challah um, next week. Just with so many different changes in the world and our lives, I'm looking forward to something that's marked my holiday celebration for a while. I invoke my grandmother with my sweet raisin challah. And um, that's, that for me is going to be a little bit of normalcy. Yeah. Yeah. That, thank you for sharing that. And I think there is something about these symbols, which in Judaism and Jewish ritual in general, that can help us in a world that really everything feels uh, changing and a little upside down and difficult, these symbols can help us return to something that is traditional and familiar, um, even while we have to experience the high holidays in different ways. Thank you for sharing that. Um, I wanna go on and do a deep dive into, uh, into the shofar specifically. Um, and I'll start just by allowing us, because the shofar is so connected, not just to the visual or to the taste, um, but the sense of hearing is so important with the shofar. I'm just going to play a blast to kind of uh, ground us, and because it's Elul, uh, and it's great to hear the shofar every day. The shofar, um, such a powerful symbol. And oops, ah, hold on. Why is this Something is now playing in the background. <laughs> Sorry about that. Um, all right, let me go back to here and share. Uh, one of the things that I, I find so powerful about the shofar is looking at where it comes from and how the rabbis talk about the shofar. Uh, so I'm going to take us to a text for us to look at together about this woman here, uh, this woman who is Sisera, Sisera's mother, who was an army general. Uh, many of you know this story because it's from the book of Judges. And the rabbis of the Talmud of the oral tradition pick up on this. Um, and they sh they uh, what they do is they they have a lot of fun with being able to talk about where the shofar comes from uh, in really interesting and, and I think moving ways. So uh, let me click us there so I can share my screen. And I think I need to do a new share so you can see this. Okay. All right, so let me make this a little bit bigger so everyone can see this. Can someone give me a thumbs up just to make sure the, uh, you can see um, the, the text now and not the PowerPoint? Yeah, okay, I'll make this bigger. So this is uh, from a great website called Safaria, which you ever want to find a text is, is really helpful. Um, so what happens is the 
the way the oral tradition works, just a quick introduction, is we have our Mishnah, which is redacted in about 200 of the Common Era. And the Gemara or the Talmud is oftentimes commentating on the Mishnah, that tradition, and then oftentimes even connecting the Mishnah and the commentary back to the Torah and the prophets and the books around that. So it's, it's sort of a back and forth commentary. Um, what, is, what is happening here is the rabbis are arguing about the different sounds of the shofar, how long they are, and, and where they come from. So the, so the Mishnah comes out here, and the Mishnah introduces that the length of the truah, um, of the blast, the truah, which we now know is true, ah, 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 it's the one that's nine blasts. They're saying that that is equal to the length of, of three yivavot. And this word yivavot is going to take on a significance here. It's the length of three whimpers. But then they say, the Gemara asks, but wait a minute, isn't there a brighta? A brighta is like an, another Mishnaic text, another text that is now contradicting that Mishnah. But wait a minute, didn't they say someplace else that the length of Trua is actually the length not of, of three Shvarim, that that would be longer? So the rabbis now have a disagreement, which is oftentimes the case in the Talmud, that they are going to need to resolve. Um, okay, so now we get down to the text that I wanted to take a look at to you. So we've established that there's this agreement. And then they have to figure out, so how long is the trua? How long is that sounding of a trua? Um, what is it? So um, th th they go on to say that, um, uh, so that it is a yiviva, going back to that whimper. And the Gemara quotes a verse that is written from the Book of Judges about, this is where we're getting into the mother of Sephora. Through the window, she looked forth and wail. And there they're going to use the same Hebrew word, root word, the yivavot, but now it's um, vata yahev, the mother of Sistra. One sage, then someone else, holds that it actually means moanings. Um, and, and then they're going to go on to, it actually might be whimpers. So the Gemara is going to go on and argue a little bit. So. I don't want to get lost in too, too much the wordplay in the details of the Talmud. And if you're feeling confused by it, don't worry. Um, the Talmud is super terse language, so it, it takes a while to, to understand it. I think the key point here is, what is it that the shofar blasts are being compared to? It's the moans or the cries of the mother, the unnamed mother, of an army general, a Canaanite army general, our enemy, Sisera, who uh, I'll pull up the, the text where it talks about it from Judges to the side here. Let me make this a little smaller, um, where, where it comes from here. So um, as we see here that what, what happens is Sisera is killed. This is the story about our prophetess Devora and uh, and Sisera is killed by a tent pole from Yael, this very uh, gallant and brave woman. And then Sisera is waiting at the window for, Susie, excuse me, Sisera's mother is waiting at the window for Sisera to come home from war, saying, what, when is it coming? Why is his chariot not here? And you can see from the verse, that that same root, Yeviva, is what is described as her whimpers, her cries, as she's waiting for her son to come home from war. And that is what the shofar is compared to. It's the cries of our mothers. It's the cries of a mother of an, of an enemy. And it's the, the spiritual cries, the longing um, that sort of roots us in a sense of loss, a sense of longing, a sense of disruption or not knowing what's next. Um, and, uh, and that's where we get the shofar 
blast from, which I think gives it an interesting new texture to the meaning of the shofar for us at any time. And, uh, and, and I think in particular this time, that is, is a very powerful narrative for us. So now that we've taken a, a little bit of a look at the um, textual tradition of the shofar, I want to go back to a place of our own of our own lives and to think about how that lands for us uh, personally. Yeah, just so Karen, did you want to add something? Yeah, please. I want. I have a question. Uh, uh, did I just hear that uh, this givava was the cry of a mother who was an enemy to us? Yeah. Yep. So that what we're kind of saying is the the cry of loss is kind of a universal? Yes. Yes, absolutely. So there's a sense, yeah, exactly. It's the enemy's mother is the wailing of the, sh that this, that's what. And there's so many powerful things about that in terms of the universality of the pro cry, in terms of the invitation to think about those that are in tension or different than us, either uh, that are very close to us or that might be very the most different from us and whatever that means um, for us individually or collectively. Um, but absolutely, that, that's, that is exactly what it's compared to. Yeah. Okay. So let me share my screen so we can go back here. And I'll turn it back to, and there she is, you know, just looking, looking at the window, waiting uh, this last, this last picture on the side here, waiting for her son to come home. Um, so what I'd like to invite us to do in, is in a moment, uh, Sarah's going to break us out into breakout groups, groups of about three. Um, and what I would like to invite you to do is to share a shofar moment that you've had in this past year, um, a time that perhaps shook you awake, or it could be a person um, that sort of shook you awake somehow this past year. Perhaps it marked a time, a change, or, or moved you into deeper understanding. Um, and we're going to have an opportunity to share a moment. Uh, so think of, 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 a, of a moment or a person that might be a shofar to you this past year. Um, I'll give you an example before we, before we break out. Um, in the, uh, I think about a month into when we went into quarantine, um, I had an experience. It was a Shabbat afternoon, and I was uh, sitting in a, a little blow-up pool in our backyard with my four-year-old daughter, Liel. And Liel turned to me and she said, Ima, what are you grateful for? And I kind of looked at her strange because it's not exactly something I would expect a four-year-old to ask her mother. Uh, but then I realized that she'd been kind of listening to me leading a Tat Shabbat service for, for my synagogue down here in Foster City. And she'd kind of sponged the language around moda ani, around gratitude um, that I'd been asking the children and families. And she was reflecting it back at me. And then she went on and she said, well, Ima, while you think about it, I will share that I'm really grateful for you and Abba. And I'm grateful for this pool that we can splash in. And I'm really grateful that we're all, including soft anxiety and grandma and pup are all healthy right now. Um, and what a mere moment. For me, that was a shofar moment because it was a hard time for us. I run a summer camp, and so we were, we were facing needing to cancel for the summer, and there was so much that was new and difficult. And to have her reflect back at me in that shofar moment, the lens of returning to gratitude was very powerful and I think really set the tone for for my perspective and ability to sort of walk through a difficult following months with that question. So that's just an example of one that many sort of shofar moments that I know I've faced in this last year. Um, and now we're going to break out 
and share a shofar moment. If you can't quite think of a shofar moment, then maybe just share a moment that sticks out for you that has been powerful uh, in this past year. Any questions um, that anyone has? Uh, and for those of you that are on Facebook, we're gonna we're gonna stop the Facebook while um, while we break out into our individual uh, groups. Any any questions before we before we break out? Uh, are we going to receive breakout our breakout rooms uh, groups? Yes, I'm. Yeah, you'll receive it. Mm -hmm. Yeah, great question. You're going to receive an invitation to go to your breakout room. Yeah. And then when your breakout room is over, we're going to come back and continue our lesson. So don't leave us. You, when, you'll go back and you'll leave the breakout room and return to the main session. Um, we're, going to have, we're going to give each person about two to three minutes to share. So we'll break out for a total um, of about eight or nine minutes. Uh, and then we'll come back um, and, uh, and finish off together. Okay. I need a breakout room. <laughs> yep. So I'm uh, opening the rooms right now. There's going to be three to four people in each room and we'll give you about six minutes. So you should have been invited to join it right now.
Welcome back, everyone. I hope you had interesting, meaningful, fruitful conversations about uh, different shofar moments and hopefully what you heard from your friends uh, and community members um, also helped to um, shape a little bit and, and inspire new ideas uh, for you as well um, as, we, as we think about the, the symbols in our high holiday. Um, before we talk a little bit about taking, taking this home, um, connected to the shofar, uh, I wanted to share uh, a poem uh, that I wrote about the shofar to kind of further get us thinking about this as a powerful symbol for us, uh, for us this year and, 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 and every year really based on this, these ideas of uh, how remarkable, how thought provoking, how moving it is that the sounding of the shofar is compared to the weeping cries of our enemy's mother worried about her child. So this is called, uh, what is shofar? For years, I watched it with wide eyes, the smooth curves of the horn and an instrument of alarm without keys or strings or screens. The heavy breathing of the ballet to Kia, the shofar player, and the congregation holding its breath and glancing at sec as seconds passed on wristwatches at the age of at the edge of our purple seats of sinners. Until one day I realized. We are commanded, Lishmoa Kol Shofar, to hear the yearning, not to see the show. So I closed my chocolate eyes hesitantly, letting go of control over my surroundings. And it was as if I had chosen not to watch the reds and yellows announcing autumn or the birth of kittens. What voice would I would greet? my ears. I jolted in surprise with the first blast, drawn in a world of sound waves, Shema in the language of the heart, as only the ears can detect. I only heard shofar. And what is shofar? Shofar is like the voice of our tears a small whimper of a mother waiting for us back at home with honey cake and brisket as she leaves through the album of last year's picturesque moments and painful failures, reminiscing over the tear-stained memories and waiting to turn the page of the book of life to the coming year. Shofar is like the vibration of our tears, long, slow moans, who did I not become this year? Accomplishment, accomplishments let go, like stale bread or tossed crust of aspirations for the office, the body, the school, or the home. I simply didn't get to it. I had to let it go. I'm sorry, mom. Shofar is the sound of us that could quite possibly shake the whole world upside down to being right side up in tears of laughter and crashes of rejoicing and relief or attuned to a voice exactly who we are at our core, a still small voice we could not hear before, but desperately needed to, finally our own voice or that of God. I ask you because the shofar is simply a symbol, just a symbol, who is your shofar this year? Who is she, young or old, who calls you to return now to forgive the one you haven't been able to face in your home, in your body, or in your own city? Who is she this year for you, for us, and to what does she draw our utmost attention? To the shofar that the world desperately needs to hear listen listen to the vibration of her tears rippling through our sanctuaries close your eyes and listen as if the world depended on it because perhaps it does listen because you came here to hear her or be her 
just a little poem as an offering. Um, and now I'm gonna go back to uh, this, bringing it home. So um, what are some things you can think about uh, as we head into Rosh Hashanah? Um, I know that Rabbi Steinberg is talking about some things related to Teshuva and Rabbi Leiter talking about other things as well. I think when it relates to these simanim, these symbols, uh, there's a number of things that we can, we can do. Uh, first of all, I encourage you to think about incorporating some elements of the food symbols, um, which you might already um, to some extent, maybe you do to a major extent, but um, thinking about the Rosh Hashanah Seder, this is just one image of uh, some of the symbols that we talked about um, today. Um, there are some great resources. PJ Library has a whole High Holiday Seder resources at home um, that you can use with blessings or maybe just bring one, one symbol, one meaningful food to your table this year. Um, the meals are gonna be different. Many of us shared them with family or friends as we heard about earlier um, that we may or may not zoom into or be able to join in person. So thinking about who we can bring to our table and what and what the symbols can, uh, can add in terms of meaning. Um, also, I think when it comes to sitting in services, I think because we're not there in person, um, the symbols that we have and what we have in our prayer space in our offices or living rooms or wherever we're zooming into the wonderful meaningful koshofar services um I, I think is also an opportunity how you dress yourself when you show up to services um i know for, on shabbat i'm always tempted to show up in my pajamas or something with slippers because you can, but there's also something really spiritual and holy about adorning yourself for the day um, in a way that I think is also really meaningful. Um, you can bring the foods to the, to the service. The Zoom background is making it difficult to see my, my honey, but, um, or bring your own shofar if you have one, if you like to play along to, with the, um, Bale Tikiya, the shofar blower, um, or whatever is that's sort of meaningful to you to think about what you bring into your space, uh, I think, for services as well in terms of similing. Um, other ways, I think, to consider sort of bringing this home is through journaling. If you're someone that likes to write or a reflective conversation um, that can happen before the holidays or or during the holidays to sort of bring the the content home um the the nice thing about zoom is that when you're muted you can really say anything without needing to worry about being too loud in the back of the sanctuary so it can be an opportunity to ha have a discourse even in the middle of a vinu malkenu which might seem a little sacrilegious but can also be a holy moment it reminds me so much of the the story of the young boy who's singing the Aleph Bet to interrupt the service or playing his flute. There's two versions of it. And the rabbi uh, that, you know, the rabbi says, oh, yes, that's 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 coming from the heart. That's really true. Um, that whatever it is that we're sharing is uh, is meaningful us in whatever language or or music that that is meaningful. Um, I think also the Tashli ceremony, which we traditionally do with breadcrumbs on first day Rosh Hashanah. Um, will also feel different, but as an opportunity to do with intention. Um, and I know uh, Rabbi Leiter and Rabbi Steinberg are thinking about what that looks like as a community when we won't just all walk down from the synagogue in quite the same way. Um, but I know that is a ritual that's always been very powerful for me to really think about what am I letting go of this year um, as well. Or you could be very creative and come up with a symbol for this year and this time uh, that is meaningful for you uh, to think about bringing into the high, high holidays or bringing to the high holidays. Just, just some different things to think about as we, um, as we head into this powerful season and pivoting in, in new and different ways. 
Uh, I want to end by opening up to see if anyone has anything they'd like to share, any questions or reflections um, before we uh, come to a close and, uh, and end our session today. Does anyone have anything they'd like to share um, or ask? Yeah, go ahead. I grew up uh, in a very modern Orthodox congregation, and I don't know if it was a, our rabbis always had a smaller shofar, and I seem to remember some teacher or the rabbi saying, you know, we don't use the larger ones. It was almost like those are easier to, to blow and, um, you know, we don't use that. We use, you know, the harder ones, you know, it's more uh, special or is there any, or is that just something that I misunderstood as a child or, or I don't know, somebody's, some teacher's thoughts on it? Yeah, great question. So, um, so many shofars are kosher and can be used to fulfill the mitzvah, as we talked about, of hearing the shofar. Um, shofars these days are made from a few different animals, the ram, but also other horns of animals as well. And some of them are easier to blow than others. Um, but it doesn't mean that they're not kosher for shofar. And many people have multiple, a short one and a long one that they use at uh, different times to generate different kinds of music. I mean, it really is an instrument. So to do that, there is uh, there is something to what you're saying too about the the difficulty and the challenge of um, of being able to step up uh, and be the to, to be the honor of blowing the shofar is sort of like you're representing the community at the gates of heaven almost right and it's a it's a special thing and for example there's a story that the Baal Shem Tov uh, told. Um, that uh, that there was a tryouts for for the shofar and there was a man who practiced and practiced and then showed up and was already had practiced so much and he held up a shofar and he froze and he couldn't get a note out and the rabbi oh. said you're it you're doing it for us because that spirit of sort of being in awe and fear whether it's because the shofar is so hard to blow or because it's such a holy mitzvah to perform on behalf of the community. Um, that is something that I think is also contained in the minhag or the tradition of, of what you're saying. Thank you. Yeah. I would like to say, I put something in, ta uh, in the chat about tashlit, that yes, traditionally people used to bring breadcrumbs, but that's before we realized that it was actually harmful to the environment. Mm -hmm. And there's signage up in many places now saying, please do not put bread into the water. Bird seeds is much better for the environment and much safer and, and, and more compassionate, so. Thank you. <laughs> Thank you, Louise, for, for sharing that. Love that. Yeah. Well, I wanna thank you Carol. for your teaching and um, this high holiday, I will be adding more elements to my Seder, my table, my plate. And so I thank you for that. Thank you. I haven't been quite brave enough to add the fish head, but <laughs> I do think the idea of leadership and taking initiative uh, this year is, um, uh, is, is meaningful too. And that's such a mixed up world. So um, maybe I'll be brave also. And Carol, you'll inspire me to either use a fish head or use some creative vegetarian alternative. <laughs> Good luck, yeah. That was my reaction too. Linda. I noticed that this was recording, so I was wondering, that I thought this would be very useful program to send on to my, you know, my children. Um, is, it, is, is it gonna be available for us to do that? Um, Linda, I have to get permission from the rabbis to post it, but I will make a note and try to get it sent to you. Okay, thank you. And I can share my PowerPoint slides too with, um, with, uh, with Sarah as well. And Sarah, you're welcome to pass those on as well. Did I understand that you wrote that poem? It, yeah. was, it was really very moving and um, that would be great too. Sure, yeah. I did write that, thank you. I agree, that was a lovely poem, thank you. <laughs>
Thank you. Well, I want to wish everyone a Shana Tova Umetuka. I hope that it's a really good, sweet, and meaningful, healthy holiday for you all, for all of us. And uh, it's, I look forward to seeing your faces in the Kosho Far services um, as well. Yeah, Shana Tova to you.